got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4 today. That's where we're going to be spending our time. I want to uh, ask you a question. We're going to put a picture up here on the screen. You probably don't know who this guy is. Anybody happen to know who this guy is? Probably not, right? Um, his name is Charles. Probably could have guessed that by looking at that face. Uh, Charles Earl Bowles. He was actually born, I want to get this right, 1829, and he died in 1888. Uh, he was the third, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Charles because it's, it's important to understand the character of this man. He was uh, born the third child of ten children. They had lots of kids way back then. And at the age of 20, he did kind of the first significant thing in his life. He and two of his brothers decided they were going to go to California and participate in the Great Gold Rush. They didn't have much luck. They went broke, just like pretty much everybody else that tried it. Um, they were back home in 1851 or 52. We don't know quite for sure when he made it back home to the New York area, but came back home, was there a couple of months. One of the brothers who originally went with him and another brother decided to go give it another shot because he's no quitter, and uh, they went back. And on this trip, both of his other brothers got extremely sick shortly after they got there. Both brothers end up dying, and Charles decides he's going to stay, stays another two years or so. Uh, again, doesn't, doesn't have much luck as a prospector doesn't do very good in the gold rush. In 1854, he marries a lady by the name Mary Elizabeth Johnson. And six years later, in 1860, they are in Illinois, uh, the Decatur area of Illinois. They have four kids, have a happy life. Everything seems to be going their way. In 1862, Charles, out of a great sense of duty, decides he is going to join up and participate in the Civil War. He ends up joining the 116th Illinois Regiment. He fought in some major battles of the Civil War, and by all accounts, Charles was an exemplary soldier. Uh, he was promoted very quickly within the first year of joining the Army. He was promoted to sergeant, and when he was discharged honorably with his entire unit in 1865, uh, he was actually discharged as a first lieutenant. In 1867... He decided he was going to go find some gold. Set out again. He had that gold rush fever. And so he set out again. This time uh, he went by himself to the Montana area. And also um, I think he, he went into um, Idaho as well on that trip. And he was sending letters to his wife back and forth during much of this time. And in 1871 she received a letter from him. And in this letter, he told his wife that he had had what he described as an unpleasant encounter with the Wells Fargo agents. Now, some of y'all maybe can relate to Charles. Maybe you've had some unpleasant encounters uh, with the Wells Fargo agents or with any bank agent in your day. But he vowed he was going to get his revenge in this letter. It was the last letter she ever got from Charles. She never received another letter from him. She thought he died. The letters quit coming. She never heard from him. You know, back then it was hard to find out what had happened. She, she just was certain that Charles was gone. But he wasn't dead. Charles Earl Bowles actually went on to become one of the most famous Old West stagecoach robbers of all time. He was known as Black Bart. That name may be more familiar to you if you've ever read old westerns or, or ever read any books about uh, the, the bandits of the old days. Black Bart was one of the most famous. Between 1875 and 1883, Charles, old Black Bart himself, all by himself, by the way, held up and robbed at least 28 Wells Fargo stagecoaches. The, the funny thing about Black Bart, though, was he was a real gentleman. In fact, on a couple of his robberies, he actually left behind poems he, that he had written himself. Uh, he, he, was, he, he would never, he wasn't mean to the people he robbed. They would, they would, the detectives would come and interview these people, and they would say he was the nicest man. He used words like please and thank you while he was robbing us, and uh, everybody was just really impressed with that. He never once fired his weapon. He wasn't one of these 
bandits that would like put a pistol to somebody's head and make these threats. He, he had weapons. He used weapons um, to, to get what he wanted, but he never fired his weapon. And, and he never, never hit anybody with them or, you know, like I said, put them up to people's heads or anything. He was just a very gentlemanly kind of a person. A- another interesting thing, and they didn't know this at the time about, about Black Bart, but, but they learned it later. Um, it's interesting, he conducted all of his robberies on foot. He hated horses. He was extremely terrified of horses and wanted nothing to do with them. And so all of his robberies uh, he did on foot. All in all, in the course of the years, the 28 robberies he did, he made off with over $20,000 uh, worth of money from Wells Fargo. In today's dollars, that would be about 600000 a little over $600,000. So, so he was doing pretty good, um, living much better than he was as a gold prospector, at least. His last robbery is what got him in trouble. It's always that last one, you know. Um, funny enough, his last robbery took place in the exact spot of his first robbery, and that's not why he got caught. It had nothing to do with why he got caught. The whole way he got caught was really interesting, but um, just to, to cut, cut to the chase, they actually didn't catch him that day. He just got wounded uh, in, in this chance encounter. He, he ends up getting wounded by this boy who happened to be hunting squirrels along the creek and came to the rescue of the stagecoach driver, and he gets hit in the hand he made, him, made his way off into the brush, and they went and got help and came back, and by the time they did, he was gone. But the detectives for Wells Fargo found out there in the brush a handkerchief, and this handkerchief was covered in blood. He had wrapped his hand in that handkerchief to get the blood to stop. And on that handkerchief was a, a laundry mark from a laundry mat, and it was the letters FX. Zero seven. So those detectives began visiting laundries all over California until they eventually traced that mark to a laundry in San Francisco. And they just started describing the man who the handkerchief had belonged to. And the person, the owner of the laundry, said, I know exactly who that is. That's Charles. He, he knew exactly who it was when they started describing the way he looked and the way he talked and that he was a perfect gentleman and all these other things. So they go down the street, they go to arrest him, and sure enough, he has a wound in his hand. He confesses right away uh, that, that he was the one who did it. But when they arrested him, everybody in the community was shocked. Nobody could believe it. Nobody who lived around him, nobody that he shopped with, nobody um, that lived in the boarding house. He lived in a very modest boarding house. He had just told everybody he was a mining engineer, and so he had to leave from time to time. It just so happened he left and robbed stagecoaches. Um, but everybody was stunned that the infamous bandit, Black Bart, was living right there with them, and it was Charles. He actually is only charged for the one robbery, the, the one he committed at the end was the only one they could pin on him, and uh, he pled guilty to that. He got six years in San Quentin prison for it. He's released four years into his six-year sentence for good behavior. Everybody in prison loved the guy, too. Uh, he, he was a really good person, by all accounts. And it's an interesting story, but it's one that reminds us of a point that I'm trying to make today, which is this. It's easy to be deceived. It's really easy to be deceived, and it, it's really easy to actually deceive people. Charles had deceived everyone. If we're honest, I think we can all admit two things about deception. If we're honest, I think we can all admit that we have been deceived at some point in our lives. How many of you have been deceived by someone at some point in your life? Everybody, right? Now, you don't have to raise your hand to this one, but I'm sure we would all have to if we're honest. The truth of the matter is we've all likely also participated in some form of deception against someone else at some point in our life. So not only do we know what it means to be deceived, we know what it is to deceive. Today what I want to do is I want to unpack three big areas that the devil wants to deceive you about. We're, we're really today we're laying a foundation for what we're going to do next week, which is dive deeper into this idea of deception, this collision of deception. 
We, we all just raised our hands. We can't get around the fact that this collision with deception is happening to us all the time. In fact, today as we're going through this, I think you're going to be able to see things in your own life and, and identify things in your own life that, that you would go, you know what, I think the devil's been trying to deceive me in that or maybe has already deceived me in that. And once we understand these big, broad areas, this 30, 40,000 foot view, next week we're going to be able to dive in and go deeper into this. And so I hope you'll join us for that next week. If you have your Bibles open in the book of Matthew chapter 4, we find the temptation of Jesus. It's a, a text that will be familiar to most of you. Today I want us to look deeper into the text. I don't want us just to look at it up on the surface, but I want us to actually see what the devil is trying to do to the Son of God. I want you to see the deception in this. I want you to see the manipulation that he's trying to to put on Jesus. Because this deception and this manipulation is the same thing that he is still doing to us today. In this text, we find Jesus having this direct encounter with the devil, and the devil is trying his best to deceive the Son of God. So right off the bat, before we even get started, let me just say this. If you don't think you're going to ever have a collision with deception, you're wrong. If the devil was so bold and so brave that he would go after the very Son of God, what makes you think he's going to leave you alone? He's not. He wants to deceive. That's who he is. He's a liar and a deceiver. It's in his character. So don't be so foolish as to think he's going to leave you alone. He didn't even leave Jesus alone when it came to deception. Our big idea for today is both an encouragement and a warning. Three simple words, don't be deceived. That's easy to say, it's hard to do. Because we live in a world that's full of deception, and we have an enemy who wants to deceive us. Now, I'm not telling you the devil is going to do these things in your life in this exact order he does them to Jesus. I think many times he does, but it may not always be in this order, but I promise you this, he will try to deceive you. He will try to get you to buy into deception. He will try to get you to be a part of deception. The first area he wants to, to get us in, the first big thing he does with Jesus, is he tries to deceive him about the word of God. Now we're going to unpack this a lot deeper next time, but it's important that we mention it here as a foundational idea. You have to understand this about deception. All deception is demonic. All deception comes from the devil. Deception never comes from the Lord. So deception is never innocent. Deception is never unintentional. Deception always finds its roots and its genesis in Satan, which is why it's so dangerous, church. This is why we should always be concerned when we see any form or any kind or any level of deception being leveled against us or when we sense or see any kind of deception living inside of us or springing up from our own lives. Because church, if, if we are deceiving our spouse or if we are deceiving our children, or if we are deceiving our employers, or kids, if youth, if you are deceiving your parents or your teachers, this is dangerous because it is not from God. It's from your enemy. And you have allowed your enemy to have some level of control over your life and that situation where the deception lives. So the reality is this, and again, we're going to dive into this more next week, but the reality is this, before we can deceive, we have to first be deceived. We buy into the deception before we participate in the deception. And so anytime we are a part of a deception, or practicing deception, or producing deception out of our life, the reality is, is that we have already been deceived by the devil who talked us into the deception. So when there's deception living inside of us, we should be concerned and we should want to get that out as soon as possible. Now back to this big area, the Word of God. Consider the Word of God. This is the first big, broad, general area, this category that 
that the devil wants to deceive you on. And he's been doing this for a long time. He didn't start in Matthew 4 with Jesus. He actually started in Genesis with Eve when it came to deception. And the, the thing he did to Eve and the thing he tries to do to Jesus is he wants them to doubt the word of God. He wants to deceive them in regards to the word of God. In Genesis chapter 3, you don't have to turn there in your Bible. We're not hanging out here. I just want to read it to you. It'll be on the screen. Genesis 3, 1 says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say? Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Did you catch those words? Did God really say? The deception starts with the word of God. Did God really say? Our enemy is still doing this today. We hear it all the time. I'll give you some common examples that are prevalent in our culture. Did God really say homosexuality is wrong? Did God really say marriage is between one man and one woman? Did God really say going to church is important? I mean, I can have a relationship with Jesus without going to church. I mean, did God really say I should be a part of a church? Did God really say gender roles matter? Did God really say there's a, such a thing as right and wrong? Because we live in a culture that will tell you God didn't say that. That God said you can just kind of make up right and wrong. Right is what you think is right and wrong is what you think is wrong. Did, did God really say there's such a thing as right and wrong? Did God really say believers should tithe? Did God really say there's only one way to heaven? That sounds kind of narrow-minded. I mean, did God really say that? See, these are the kinds of things the devil will say. He'll say, did God really say? He wants you to doubt the word of God, because if you doubt the word of God, you fall into the deception. So the, 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 the thing is this. When you hear that, you better know the answer to the question, did God really say? Or you better, at the very least, be able to and willing to honestly open the word of God and read it honestly to find the answer to the question, did God really say? Because I promise you, the devil will try to distort the word of God in an effort to deceive you. The devil even tried it on Jesus. Look at verse 1, Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, these, tell these stones to become bread. He, being Jesus, answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus goes back to the word. It should be noted that the devil will often attack us and tempt us and taunt us when we are in a state of weakness or vulnerability. The text says he was hungry, and that's not by accident. He was hungry. And it's in the midst of that hunger that the devil comes and says to him, if you're the son of God, why are you hungry? Why should the son of God be hungry? You're the son of God, man. You don't need to be hungry. Just tell these stones to become bread and you can eat. Simple. It was a temptation, but it was more than a temptation. It was a taunt. He's taunting Jesus. He's taunting him to show off his power. He's taunting him to provide for himself. He's taunting him to step outside of God's plan and make his own plan in his own way. Make no mistake about it. This is much more than just about Jesus being hungry. This is much more than just about his physical needs. He, he wants Jesus to doubt God's word. He wants Jesus to doubt that God, you know, God's going to take care of him. He's saying, you're the son of God, man. Just turn the stones to bread and eat. One commentator nailed it. He said it like this. He said, The purpose of the temptation was not simply for Jesus to satisfy his physical hunger, but to suggest that his being hungry was incompatible with his being the Son of God. In other words, the devil is saying, Hey, the Son of God should not have to be hungry. The commentator goes on and says, He was being tempted to doubt the Father's word, the Father's love, and the Father's provision. 
He had every right, Satan suggested, to use his own divine powers to supply what his father had not. Turning those stones into bread would have shown that Jesus didn't trust God, that he doubted his word. So in response to that, Jesus goes back to the word. He's not going to be deceived. He goes back to the word. He says, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know what? He goes back to the word for the next two taunts and temptations as well. Because he knew at the heart of all the devil's deceptions is this idea that if I can deceive you on what the word of God is, then I can deceive you on anything. Church, the devil knows if he can get you to doubt the word of God, if he can get you to ignore the word of God, then he can easily deceive you. Don't be deceived. There's a second general area we see here in the second taunt or temptation of Christ, and it is in regards to the ways of God. Just as often as the devil will say something like, did God really say, he'll say something like, Would God really do that? He he wants you to doubt the ways of God. The psychology of people is interesting. People have studied psychology for a long time. They've done a lot of study on what people believe about deities, Not not just Christianity, but all religions. And one thing that they have learned about our psychology, our flesh, is that no matter who you are or what God you worship, you tend to lean into believing that that God thinks like you think and acts like you act and has the same kind of character like you and other people you live around. Now, the Word of God tells us exactly the opposite of that. In Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But how many times have you heard someone say something like, oh, God would never do that? Or, I just don't think that a loving God would do that. Or, that that couldn't have been what God meant to say. I mean, (laughs) I know that's what it says, but... I don't think that's really what God meant for it to say. You see, when the ways of God do not line up with the ways of man, man, people, humanity, are easily deceived into a dangerous line of thinking that, that says, well, I must just be understanding, misunderstanding who God is or what God does because this doesn't line up with the way I think. And that's not the truth at all. When that happens, when you start thinking like that, you've already fallen into the deception, and now you're in danger of being deceived by the devil. Look at Matthew 4, 5 through 7. Then the devil took him up to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he says, You want to talk about the Bible? We can talk Bible. Y'all know the devil knows the Bible? He says, You want to talk Bible, Jesus? We'll talk some Bible. Throw yourself down, for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you. They will support you with their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus told him, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. He's trying to deceive Jesus. So knowing he's not going to deceive Jesus with the word of God, he attempts to use the word of God to deceive Jesus regarding the ways of God. What the devil is saying here is is this. He's saying, hey, throw yourself down off the cliff because there's absolutely no way God would let you fall. There's no way God would let you die. If you've ever been to the Holy Land with me or to the Holy Land at all, you've probably been to Jerusalem and been there where the temple is. And now up on top of the temple today, there's not much. But there used to be this grand structure up on top of that, that hill. And Over on the side, there's a big wall and a cliff that goes down into a valley. Now, at this time, when Jesus was taken there, he would have been at the pinnacle on the top of that structure. They estimate some 140 to 160 feet above the rocks below. 
So as they're looking down, that's really what the devil is saying is, hey, listen, you're, you're the son of God. God loves you. God cares about you. you know, God's got this big plan for you. So there is no way God's going to let you hit the rocks down there. Just jump off. Test God's ways. And Jesus responds again with the word of God. It's also written, do not test the Lord your God. Jesus is not going to be deceived. He saw this deception for what it was. He didn't have any reason to challenge or to test or otherwise prove that God loved him. That's what the devil's saying. Prove God loves you. Jump off here and let God catch you. And he's like, why do I need to do that? I know he loves me. Jump off here and prove that God has the power to catch you. Jesus is like, I already know he has the power. I know his ways. And just because the devil attempted to use the word of God to try to get Jesus to test the ways of God, Jesus says, I'm not falling for that. I'm not going to be deceived. And you might ask, well, how do I know God's ways if his ways are higher than my ways, if his ways are not my ways? Well, the answer would be to read God's word. If you want to know God's ways, you have to read God's word. It's why we're always telling you, read God's word. Read it a little or better. Read it a lot, but read it. Because when you know God's word, you will increasingly, over time, understand God's ways. And you will increasingly, over time, be harder and harder to deceive. So when someone says something like, why would a good God allow bad things? Or why would a gracious God condemn anyone to hell? That just doesn't sound like something God would do. Or why would an all-knowing God allow this or that to take place or to happen? Or why would a God of peace allow so many wars? Or why would a God of love, who claims to be a God of love, say, I can't love anybody I want and marry anybody I want? You see, when you know God's word and you understand God's ways, these kinds of questions are not great mysteries. You're not deceived by them. But so many people in our culture are deceived by them. And they go, oh, that does sound kind of, yeah, yeah, I think you might be right. They're deceived because they don't know the word and they don't know God's ways. So many people are deceived and led to abandon the truth and believe some shadow or some illusion Because they deduce in their mind that God's ways are the same as their ways, that God would act the same way as a human would. Church, we don't get to dictate to God what his ways should be. I don't know if you know that or not. It's just the truth. The truth of the matter is this. If we don't understand God's ways, the problem is not with God, it's with us. The truth is, if God's way doesn't make sense, he's not out of line, we're out of line. And if we believe anything other than that, we're probably going to be deceived or have already been deceived. See, Jesus wasn't deceived because he knew the word of God, and he wasn't deceived because he accepted the ways of God as God's way. So I'll tell you again, don't don't be deceived. I want to look at this final taunt and temptation of Jesus. It displays this third area where Satan will aim to deceive people. He still does it today, and that is with the will of God. Look at this final temptation here, and I want you to really consider what the devil is offering, and I want you to consider the root and the heart of this deception. It's the most egregious of all. In Matthew 4, verse 8, he says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, go away, Satan, for it is written, back to the word, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and the angels came and began to serve him. The devil saw that he wasn't going to deceive Jesus, so he got out of there. But look at what he did here. Just to cut to the chase, here's what the devil does. He offers Jesus what Jesus already has. He says, you can have the whole world. Well, Jesus already has that. See, he offers Jesus what he already has. He just offers it to him at a much cheaper price. He says, I'll give you the entire world. 
And Jesus had to kind of smiled or smirk or laughed at that. Well, you're not giving me nothing. I already got it. We, we can read verses like John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And then look at verse 3. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. Jesus is like, it's already all mine. I was there when it was created. I was a part of creating it. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, Jesus is. The firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things, all things, you can circle that, put a star by it, put a square around it, highlight it. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything, all things, to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Hebrews 1-2 in these last days, he has spoken to us by the Son. God has appointed him, Jesus, heir of all things and made the universe through him. In Revelation 3.14, Jesus says this, Write to the angel of the church of Laodicea, Thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand of the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also the age to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is the body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, for this reason God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow on heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's already got it all. But the devil says, I'll give you what you already have I'll just give it to you at a much cheaper price. All you got to do is worship me. You can have it right now, and you're not going to have to put up with all those unfaithful people. You can have it right now, and you're not going to have to put up with those undisciplined disciples. You can have it right now, and you're not going to have to face the rejection of the crowds. You can have it right now, and you're not going to have to hear them yell, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. You can have it right now and not have to go through the pain and the torture and the agony and the humiliation of dying naked on a cross above a holy city. You can have it right now if you just bend your knee and worship me. You can have what you already have just at a cheaper price, seemingly. Of course, Jesus doesn't fall for it. He says, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. But you know, the devil's still doing this today. Still today, he says, hey, you can have a new family. Well, you already got a family. What do you need a new one for? You can have a new family right now and not have to work on that marriage, not have to go through counseling, not, not have to change something about yourself. You can just go find somebody that better fits you. You, you. you can get rid of the problem with your kid right now, just buy them another box you can plug into the wall and plug into the TV and let them sit in front of it because it'll make them happy and you don't have to work on that relationship. You can have that right now at a, a cheaper price. You can get them to be quiet and be seemingly happy right now at a cheaper price if, if you'll just do this, Right? Hey, instead of having to work on the relationship with your wife or your husband, could go either way, you can have what you want right now. Just go to the computer. Just click it on. Go get it right now. Much cheaper price, right? It's deception. 
You can have it right now. You just got to get outside of the will of God. Jesus saw it for what it was. He said, I'm not falling for that. Because Jesus knew what the will of God was, and he said, I'm staying in it. Even if it's going to be hard, even if it's going to be tough, even if it's going to be brutally, agonizingly, humiliating, and painful, I'm staying in the will of God. John 5, 30, Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38 through 40, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. In Luke twenty-two forty-two, 42, Jesus is about to endure his passion. And there in the garden, just outside the city, right across that same valley I spoke of earlier, he prays there in the garden, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He was committed to the will of God from the beginning to the end. That's why he couldn't be deceived. See, the, the devil will try to deceive you when it comes to the will of God. He'll tell you, I'll give you what you want right now. I'll give you what you already have right now, just at a much cheaper price. Jesus knew what the will of God was, and he chose to be faithful and to stay in it. So it was impossible for him to be deceived because he knew the word of God, he trusted and accepted the ways of God, and he trusted and accepted the will of God, even if that wasn't what was best for him in his flesh. And only when you get to that place will you be in a place where you are not easily deceived. We're going to continue this discussion next week, but let me close with this. You remember our outlaw in the beginning? Black Bart? He was able to deceive and fool everyone for almost a decade. When they arrested him, his neighbors and his friends and the people he went to church with, the, he had even preached at his church on occasion. Even the local police were astounded. They, they told the detectives they, they had to have the wrong guy. The police in San Francisco were like, it cannot be Charles. Charles. Because he was so gentle and so upright and so nice and so humble and so honest, no one could believe Charles was the infamous criminal Black Bart. He was the last person any of them would have ever suspected. I guess it just goes to prove you can fool and deceive just about anyone, but you can't fool or deceive God. And that's what I want to close with because I think this is an important point particularly if you're not going to be with us next week. The devil couldn't deceive Jesus. So I'm going to go out on a real short limb here and say you probably can't either. I want you to see this text in Matthew 25. This is Jesus. It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and the angels with him, then he will sit in his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Do we have any sheep and goat experts in here? If you're a sheep and goat expert, would you just raise your hand? None. We had a few in the first service. Okay, no sheep or goat experts in here. Let me ask you this question. Again, raise your hand question. This is not a trick question. If I were to put you in a pen with a few hundred sheep and a few hundred goats all mixed together, how many, of think, how many of you think you could tell the difference enough to separate the sheep from the goats? Okay, so we don't have one sheep or goat expert in here, but everybody thinks they could separate the sheep from the goats because it's not hard to do that, right? You, you're not even an expert in sheep and goat. But you can tell the difference enough to know how to separate them. So if you can separate the sheep and the goat, how easy do you think it's going to be for Jesus to separate the sheep?
welcome the goat. See, the sheep are those who have been transformed, those who have been redeemed, those whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. The goats are those who chose to die in their sin, to reject the gospel, to reject Jesus. Those who spent their entire lives trying to fool God, you're not going to fool him. Stop trying to fool God. Stop trying to run from God. You can fool me. You can fool your spouse. You can fool your kids. You can fool everybody in this community just like Charles did, Black Bart. But when you stand before Jesus, you are not going to fool him. And you're either going to be put with the sheep or be put with the goats. My encouragement to you today would be to repent of your sins, to call on Jesus, to believe in the gospel, to accept the truth that he died for you and that his blood is the only way you're getting into eternity because his name is the only name by which men can be saved. He is indeed the way, the truth, and the life, the way, not a way, the way. And if you don't repent and believe, when that day comes, you're going to be in the goat pen and it ain't going to be good. Let's pray. If you've never called on Jesus, never given your life to him, we invite you to do it this morning. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front, meet us at the back, stand up, raise your hand, none of that. I'm just going to ask you to pray. Pray to God, pray to Jesus, the one who died on the cross for your sins. If that's you, just say this, say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up. I know that I've gone astray. Lord, I confess and know that I have gotten outside of your will. But today, by faith, I ask that you would change me. By faith, Lord, I ask that you would forgive me. By faith, Lord, I pray that you would cleanse me and make me new as only you can do. Lord, I thank you for your grace and for your goodness for your love and for your mercy. Father, we are so grateful and so thankful that you died for us, made a way for us. And Lord, we are grateful for warnings like this in your word when it comes to deception. There is deception all around us. Everything we listen to, everything we see, everything we watch, everywhere we go, this demonic deception collides with our world. Lord, help us to see it for what it is. Help us to be able to identify it. Lord, help us to know that we have an enemy who wants to deceive us. Lord, I pray that we would trust your word in your way and your will. I pray that we would put those things above everything else in our life so that we might not be deceived. Lord, we love you thank you, praise you, and ask your blessing now. In Jesus' name, amen.